Uh, hello, everybody. What we're doing now is we're going to talk a little bit, first of all, Maya, and tell us about the famous court case and the upshot of it and how you came to form Sex Matters. And then I'd like Helen and, and Maya to discuss Sex Matters, because frankly, we've all seen Sex Matters begin with a bang and then just go to great heights in, in, in the short time it's been, it's been in uh, existence. So first of all, Maya, <laughs> tell us, I'm sure most of us know the details of the court case, but for anybody who doesn't, it is nice to know <laughs> this amazing story. Um, so four years ago, uh, I was working at an international development think tank and I started to get interested in this topic. I'm not a doctor I'm nothing to do with medicine I am a mother um and I you know I looked at this and thought it was crazy and thought I should be able to talk about this and write about this and I was in the UK where the government at the time was consulting on whether to uh reform the gender recognition act to make it easier for people to change their sex uh and asking for people to engage in that as a democratic question and so I thought well I should be able to do this uh and the organization that I worked for I was based in London, but actually it was a US uh, organization. And as, almost as soon as I started tweeting about it, uh, people in the US complained and said, it's transphobic. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and that kind of kicked off with just a whole uh, cascade of, of panic in the organization. And this was an organization that was, it, it was economic development. So they were hard nosed people um, evidence-based, numbersy, not fluffy, not identity people, but just those three words, or two words, it's transphobic, kicked off this panic, um, and they investigated me, and then they made the huge mistake of bringing in diversity consultants. You know, you bring in consultants to tell you there's a problem. Once they tell you there's a problem, you can't then say there isn't a problem, because then you know, the finger gets pointed at you. So all of these people within this organization who I knew to be sensible and I knew were not part of this ideology sort of one by one fell over and <laughs> I ended up uh, losing my job. And then I tweeted about that. Uh, and there were a bunch of feminist lawyers who were looking for a case just like mine. They sort of imagined me and then I came into existence. <laughs> um, and they, did they message you or what? Yes, what did they yeah, mean? so um, very secretive. Oh, really? they, they treat, <laughs> oh, no, they they treated me so so. Um, it took six months for me to lose my job. It was a long and slightly boring process. Uh, but by the time I lost my job, the problem is that when you want to bring a tribunal case, there's a time limit. So and the time limit starts um, for each act of discrimination. You've got three months to bring the case. So as soon as I lost my job the time limit was already running out on the early wow. things of discrimination. So I tweeted that I lost my job um, and a barrister uh, messaged me and said, we're interested. Um, and could I just ask, because I know lots of people who've lost their job and they often hide in shame. They don't tweet about it, if you follow me. Yeah, um, I think because it had taken six months and because I, and in that time I tried to negotiate, I, you know, I... Um, from the very first time that they emailed me and said, uh, could you put a disclaimer on your tweets? Uh, please don't use exclusionary language. And I went back and said, you know, it's not exclusionary to say that men are not women and women are not men. It's just those are just categories. Um, but of course, and I said at the time, of course, I would use anyone's pronouns in a professional situation. Um, and all the way through this process, I'd said to them, you know, I will not talk about this in the office if, if you don't want me to talk about it, but I will talk about it on Twitter. Um, and so by the time, okay, yeah. you know, sort of six months down the road, I had just like, I had no more fucks left to give. And, <laughs> but, and I also, I mean, I didn't, because, because my job was slightly complicated, I, I wasn't a straightforward employee. So I also didn't think I had any employment rights. So I thought that the only thing that I could do was just to say in public, this happened to me. Um, and then I discovered that actually I did have employment rights as a contractor um, that I didn't know I had. And then within eight days of tweeting that I'd lost my job, we put in the claim to the employment tribunal. And it all kicked off from there, really. It did. It, it did. did. It did. And I remember the devastation. I think I was texting Lisa Marciano, who's in the audience there, 
Oh, uh, you, you, you lost your first case. Yes. And the whole of our world, it was like a grey cloud. <laughs> it was really... Yeah, mine, mine too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then JK Rowling jumped in. Yes, yeah. So uh, the, the first bit of the case was um, just the principle of is the belief, the belief, you know, the belief that your grandmother has that men are men and women are women. They, they call it philosophical belief, but it's so not fancy. Um, just the belief that there are two sexes, is that protected under the Equality Act and under um, Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights, Freedom of Religion and Belief? That was the test. And um, famously, I lost it. And the judge said that the belief is not worthy of respect in a democratic society. <laughs> You know, which means it's open season. It means anyone can discriminate against or harass you because you have this belief, because this belief is so um, heinous and so unacceptable that they can treat you as basically subhuman. I, that That's what that judgment meant. Um, and uh, yeah, I was. You, you met you met the judge. I was yes. I was in the bar last night, and I met Maya. And yeah, we, we both met James yes. Taylor at a party. Yeah, yes. like two weeks ago. I brought Helen along as my as my wing person to to back me up. So we've got to go and talk. I went to um, Aqua Reindorf's uh, silk party. So she's a, a barrister becoming a a KC, and they have a party, and they invite all the judges and barristers. And I was there, and James Taylor, the judge in my first case, uh, was there. So I went up and shook his hand, and I said, um, we're thinking about who to cast in the film. Do you have any suggestions? <laughs> a while ago, I asked Maya for advice for anyone else who's taking a high-profile case, and she said, oh, you must keep a diary. And I said, oh, so that you know what happened when? And she said, no, for the film. <laughs> And then you won the second case. Yes. So then, when, then I appealed it to the Employment Appeal Tribunal, which is the higher higher court. So that means it creates a precedent that is um, uh, acts on other employment cases, but also other cases in the UK that use the Equality Act. So that includes goods and services. So all kinds of discrimination. There is now precedent set because of my case, because I won the second part, um, which is that this belief is protected. And it's protected in the same way that um, you're protected against discrimination for having a religion, any religion, and for not having a religion. So not being Christian, not being Muslim is just as protected as being Christian, being a Muslim, being a Buddhist, um, being, you know, all kinds of beliefs, secular and religious that are uh, serious, coherent, and that sort of um, compel your life, uh, and and that and that's really important. And although the precedent is in the UK, because the precedent relies on Article Nine, the European Convention on Human Rights, it means that it is um, uh, it's not binding, but it's um, what's persuasive. the word persuasive? Thank you. Uh, in the rest of Europe, and so there's already been a case in Norway based on this, a woman actually scarily similar to me, she lost her job working for a not-for-profit um, for wanting to tweet about this and she actually tweeted something that I'd written. <laughs> and that, oh. Yeah, so I went and I went and was an uh, expert or was a witness in her case. Um, so that was the first one outside of the UK um, and I think there may be one at some point in Ireland. In Ireland it's a little bit different because the statute says religion it doesn't yeah. say religion or belief, but because it's all based on the European Convention, even though it says religion, a case should be able to show that it's religion or or not religion. That's a big deal in, uh, for anybody who's interested in Irish law, that they put in religion and didn't put in belief makes it messy. The case has to be ha had. Yeah. Be, yeah. We need an Irish Maya. Yes, you do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then, did you know you were going to start, start Sex Matters? Or d tell us about that, because I, I know Helen joined you at some point. So, um, Yeah, I was trying to think about when we um, oh, sort yeah. of started Sex Matters. And I think it was, I was on the train to Edinburgh. It's the first time for, I mean, I've been to Edinburgh before, but the first time for sex and gender, um, I went up to Edinburgh with a couple of lawyers to go and speak to the um, Scottish Parliament about this. And on the train back, we said, yeah, we need an organization. Um, so that was uh, November 2020. Yeah, it was 2020. Um, we 
Two we said we need, we need an organization. Mm -hmm. And so um, Anya Palmer, who was my barrister, who was the one who kind of dreamed up the idea of my case before I existed, um, was... Who's Irish. Who's Irish, uh, was Stonewall's second employee. Uh, she was at Stonewall when they were doing the gay rights case, the, the age of consent cases. Um, and, and it's odd, like every time we sit around and we go through kind of strategy, what, how should we do, what should sex matters be, how should it work, it almost always ends up with, let's do what Stonewall did in terms of, oh. in terms of the kind of organization we are. So we're non-partisan, um, we're not a membership organization, we're not tied to a particular ideology, we're not a feminist organization, we're for everybody, we're broad based um, and we're focused on uh, legal and political change so that that's a kind of like stonewall model i didn't know that <laughs> yes okay okay um i want to point out to people we will have q a later on in about in about 15 minutes and i forgot to say we do have hashtags um for today's event so time's up w path hashtag time's up w path is a biggie <laughs> and gen spec bigger picture and uh, I'm sure others will, will take off, but I, I do appreciate any tweets and shares and all that sort of stuff. Just to remind EPATH and WPATH that we're here and uh, that we have points to make. So to go back to um, Sex Matters, when did Helen come? I, I just, I, 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 it's like you've arrived and I, I, I was never really quite sure what actually happened. Um. So when I was still at The Economist, obviously you can't be an activist and be a journalist, at a, especially at a publication that has no bylines. So, you know, I'd become friends with Maya by meeting her to interview her about her toxic beliefs. Um, I, I, I played a part in her losing her job because I managed to put together a set of viewpoint essays. I'm still quite proud of this for The Economist's website. Uh, we turned uh, 175 at The Economist in, uh, when was it? It was 2018. And we had a year of sort of celebrations of that. And, you know, The Economist is all about liberalism, broadly defined. So it was open society, open this, that and the other was the theme for the year. And I said we should do open debate. And I said that the topic, the one topic that you're not allowed to debate is this one. And, you know, I still am amazed that I managed to get about a half a dozen people like um, Sally Hines, James Morton, you know, people who really disagree with us to write essays. But anyway, Maya saw this. And of course, at the CGD where she worked, you know, the economist got put in the lobby every week and and she she's told me since that she thought to herself um you know if this, if the economist is doing this it must be okay <laughs> sorry <laughs> it was not okay <laughs> but yes yeah, so i wrote my book and i took time off from the economist to do that and we kept talking and we often just chatted about what was going on but i couldn't join sex matters and i went back to my job um and i was doing i was i was the britain editor at the economist so i was commissioning and uh, editing articles about british politics and economics and so on and at some point I just went you know I just don't want to be here this is not what I want to be doing and and I we're not a feminist organization but I just really wanted to use this line I said to Helen come and be a lobbyist for big vagina <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah so I, I I took a year's leave of absence from the economist that started you know auspiciously enough on 1st of April um 2022 and then on 1st of April 2023, I said what did not surprise them when I said it before then, that I was not going back. Uh, so I have left The Economist now and I can say what I like. Wow. Not that I wasn't, not say, wasn't saying what I like before. Um, the, that's, none of that is the reason why Sex Matters is a powerhouse. Um, <laughs> I have a big revelation for you all, which is she's triplets. It's the only <laughs> possible explanation for her level of productivity. <laughs> so. it's, it's, we, just, we just run on anger, basically. <laughs> Anger and humour. Yes. The, the, the sex yeah. matters chat is where yeah. all the magic happens. Michael Biggs, yeah. who's in the room, yeah, will confirm say. that. Yeah, we, we have a small staff team and then we have a board, um, which includes Michael Biggs, who's here, um, Emma Hilton, who, uh, fond, of, fond of Beatles, if you know her on Twitter, um, Rebecca Bull, a uh, uh, couple of lawyers, Naomi Cunningham. Um, so we have a kind of brain trust and a small dedicated team that runs on anger, basically. Well done. <laughs> and you, you're... An organisation that campaigns to bring around legal and social change. Clarity, clarity on sex in law and policy. We, the, the main thing that we want is clarity. If you can say that men are men, women are women, you yeah. know, boys grow up to be men, women grow up to be girls. Every, every, I'm sorry, <laughs> did I just say yeah. Yeah. But all of that stuff about, you know, 
the freedom to swing your fist ends where my nose begins yeah. depends on being to, being able to say that's a fist that's a nose that's that's what we want to be able to do and you know we're not medical experts but we are increasingly also particularly talking about children we start we started off um talking about the law talking about clarity in the law um talking about employment um but we've taken on schools as such an important place where this happens where the ideology is spread but also schools are a rules-based institution they're a microcosm of society and all of the questions about fists and noses all take place in schools and if we can solve them in school we think that you know that then gives us a basis for solving those issues more widely and similarly, the trans rights activists, the gender ideology movement have targeted schools and children uh, in order to promote this. So that's been a big part of what we've been doing over the past year. And we're very focused on the UK because we're focused on law. It, you know, you have to be very specific to the laws of the place that you understand. So we're very focused on the UK where we think there is a ton of momentum, which we hope will help other countries but we only understand really UK law so that's what we're focused on. Yeah I was going to bring that up as a flaw. <laughs> <laughs> Listen there's only three of her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's sex matters and we, we anybody who's interested in this world knows what sex matters doing and it's phenomenal and then I'm thinking well what about the other countries and w what is your line is it well go and find a fund start uh, sex matters in other countries or is there any in any other country? I mean, there are people and we talk to them. Um, and of course, it's, you know, it isn't just sex matters. Like people sometimes think that this is a chaos, but it's a very productive chaos. There's lots of other organizations and Stella mentioned mm. many of them. And we all talk to each other all the time and different people have landed on different bits of it. They care about sports or prisons or they're experts in child safeguarding or whatever. Um, and, you know, all of that tends to be quite harmonious, mostly, <laughs> but anyway, very productive. I think that is the right model for everywhere. Um, we, we hope that the UK can be like a beacon on this, that we can show people that you can respect the rights of people who do identify in different ways, because I've no problem with that. I honestly don't mind whatever anybody else wants to think about themselves. I've no problem with people's religions, even though I'm an atheist, and that will be my model for it. I can live in the same, the same world as people who have many different beliefs. I just want them to respect the fact that I have beliefs and that those have consequences for me. And the UK framework of law is quite well suited to this. So the law has been badly applied and very much distorted, but we think that there's a good framework there. And if we can hold on to that framework and establish the way that that framework is used, then we can show people elsewhere that it is possible to accommodate this novel belief in gender identity in a rules and rights based society where other people's rights are respected too. Like increasingly we say to each other, other people have rights too. That's kind of our five word <laughs> model. And like, you know, I, I can see Malcolm is here from LGB Alliance. Very welcome, Malcolm. And there's different countries, LGB Alliance, America, LGB Alliance, Australia. Is there an equivalent with sex matters or is there going to be, or is that? I mean, I hope there will, but we haven't heard of one. <laughs> no, yes, I mean, I, I think. Because America is the big one. Yeah. But, and they have so and, many different states. And they have so many different states. I mean, I think to be a legally focused organisation, you really have to understand the law in the place where you are. Um, and, you know, it's hard enough for us to do England, uh, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, you know, schools policy, NHS, you know, all of that stuff is different just across those four nations. Um, and then, so, you know, I went to Norway and it was like going through a mirror there were all the same groups, the same organizations, the same, um, you know, debates and tensions. And I think it's quite helpful for us to have connections, but there's no way we could go to Norway and tell them wow. how to do it. So if you think about the LGB Alliance model, yeah. I mean, what you're saying is, you know, there is sexual orientation and it's real. Like yeah. that's exportable. Mm. I mean, it was there already everywhere, you know, whereas what, you know, the sorts of things we end up saying are things like, uh, oh, the school's regulations 2006 yeah. requires you to register children at age four, da, 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 you know, like, you know, that's really an important part of one of the things we're saying in the, in our attempts to get the, D the Department for Education to produce good schools guidance. You would have to do something similar, but it would have to be your own laws. 
And there will be some read across because, as Maya said, some of these things come from the European Convention and a ruling in one country is persuasive in others. And, and human rights, other, you know, other, you, other principles. human rights um, frameworks, you know, it's all similar. Um, so, so we say we are a human rights organisation and we really are a human rights organisation. We think that the way to solve this is by using the human rights framework and that bit is exportable. Mm. Um, but... The detail isn't. The detail isn't. I think it's really um, important that people understand that what we're trying to do is to shore up a system within, a, you know, the liberal human rights system within which we do have a shared conception of what's good, but we also prioritise freedoms. Because people too often think that what this is is a political and public opinion fight. And public opinion does matter, but public opinion has never been on the side, in fact, of pretending that sex isn't real. Like this is this is an elite movement that is is held by a smallish segment of society that has outsized influence in academia, the media, and other institutions that have disproportionate voice. Um, if this could be answered by doing an opinion poll, it would have been answered by yeah. now, and it would have been answered in our favour. Yeah, we do need to bring people along with us, but actually, we just we need the laws to be sound and sensible and enforced. Uh, so that's why we focus on that. And of course, the political side of things is to stop them from making things worse. Like we just pulled back gender self-ID by the skin of our, its teeth mm. in England. And, you know, you lost that fight before you even knew that fight was happening here in Ireland. And that's going to take 20 years minimum to get rid of because that's what laws take to get rid of minimum. Um, so you, you've got 20 years before you can even get to where we are, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> Better to start now, you know, you know, they say about trees, the best time to plant one was 10 years ago. The second best time is today. Um, yeah, so we, we try, we, we're engaging politically to try to stop them making things worse, but also to try to get the traction in order that we don't have to keep taking legal cases. Yeah. So if we write good schools guidance, if the DfE writes good schools guidance, then we won't have to take their schools guidance to judicial review. On that subject, the the... What I saw was uh, that England, it's moving in the right direction. Yeah, that England produced, for, for, from what I know, the first guidance on social transition. And um, they, they are still working on it. Well, yeah, they're making sounds around. Um, yes. Yes. So it, it, yes. We are very, 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 very deeply engaged in this, as are some of the other people in this room and some of the other yeah. Um, groups. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. we also, the clock is ticking because this government will come to an end in a year or so. And yeah. So tell us, what do you think, A, I want to uh, know, what are your big wins so far and where are you going? I can see you're going for education, mm -hmm. but so, where are you going over the next year or two? And what do you advise? Because I'm hoping in the don't mourn me organised vibe, I'm hoping people are going to be inspired and think, actually, I'm going to set it up in my state. I'm going to set it up in my country. This is uh, the model is there. Do, do you know what I mean? So if all they have to do is be inspired, a <laughs> little bit of energy, maybe. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the one, the fact that we set up, we, you know, that we're going, that we are a thing, I think that in itself is is important. Um, our biggest win this year has been we organised a parliamentary petition. So this is an official, there's an official petition site for the UK government. Um, and we asked to clarify the Equality Act to make clear that the protected characteristic of sex, male and female, and the protected characteristic of what they call gender reassignment, which is anything to do with transition, are two separate characteristics. Race, disability, age, there are nine different characteristics, and we say both characteristics are protected. We got over 100,000 signatures on that petition, which before that, I think the largest sort of gender critical petition was got about 20,000. So it's a big leap, and it means it's going to be debated in Parliament, and the government has asked the Equality and Human Rights Commission, which is the regulator for um, equality legislation, for their opinion on it. And they said, we think it's a good idea. 19 pages of we think it's a good idea, very <laughs> detailed. Um, so this is huge. And this will, um, if we can get this passed, it will clarify that law. And, and you can't, where we are at the moment, a lot of, a, a lot of, the sort of trans rights or human rights claims depend on ambiguity. They depend on never saying what the human right is, or what the right is. It's just trans rights are human rights, and if you disagree, you're a bigot. Uh, you, once you get clarity, you can't go back to ambiguity. So this is why we want to get this nailed down. So I, I was thinking about this, and you know that sign 
um, that shopkeepers used to put up that said, um, don't ask for credit because a refusal often offends. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. it, it depends on you not actually saying what it is, like where the nose is and where the fist is. And sometimes when we're talking about this debate in Parliament, like we look back at the debate there was before the Gender Recognition Act and the debate before the Equality Act, and nobody has ever stood up in Parliament or in any Parliament that I know of and said, does a man, an anatomically normal man, have the right to go into a changing room, strip off, get his penis out and shower in front of a teenage girl? And it will be my life's work uh -huh. if I manage to get a parliamentarian to ask that question because yes or no are the only two answers. But this a refusal often offends, I think, has been the yeah. approach. We're meant to understand that this man says he's a woman and okay, you know, you don't want to be mean, but you don't think about that use case. You think about the man dressed, you think about him having long hair, you think about him maybe passing as a woman. You don't think he's going to ask to go into the changing room and get his cock out because a refusal would often offend. Yes. <laughs> And, you know, the root, it is offending. It is offending us, but we're not allowed to refuse. So that ambiguity has to go. We have to get to the point where we say, you know, where are you allowed to be? What does it mean if you say you are a woman? What does this thing live as a woman mean in that sort of situation? Yeah. And, and then, I, you know, the, when I started talking about this, what's the one, I started tweeting about this and I wrote a, a sort of essay, a blog post, which was like um, 1,400 words and it had half a sentence on the medical stuff and it, it said it said something like um people are increasingly concerned about the the rising numbers of children on puberty blockers and hormones and that was all i felt that i could say because i'm not a doctor i'm not an expert and i i talked all about single sex spaces and sport and all the rest because i thought i can i can say i know what a man is what a woman is but i thought these doctors, at that point, I thought these doctors must know what they're doing in some way. And all I could say was this kind of marker for we should be able to talk about this. But I think once you're able to say a refusal does offend, you don't have the right to compel other people's speech. You will never have the right to use opposite sex services. You don't have the right to be employed in a job where your job involves... Um, Intimate. intimate examinate you know as a doctor or a police officer or a prison officer you know if you have transitioned that doesn't mean that a man can strip search a woman because of his identity I mean this is currently what the Ministry of Justice in the UK is wo wondering what the answer to this question is once you can have that clarity to say those things are not rights then it's much clearer I think that what the doctors are doing is mis-selling because what they're saying is we could do these extraordinary, experimental, not very satisfactory things to people's body on the expectation that everyone else will comply. But if it's clear that people won't comply, people may accommodate in other ways, but they're not going to comply, then I think it becomes very clear that these doctors have been mis-selling something which is objectively harmful. Brilliant. Yeah. I think that they... Um the promise, the unstated promise has always been that you actually can change sex. And I mean, we know that you can't, but I mean that you can change sex in the sense that if you if you do go through all this stuff, what comes out at the other end is something that everybody else will accept. And I think that can only have happened because people haven't thought about the difficult use cases because they've assumed that people wouldn't put themselves into that position. You know, that this man who has transitioned and now lives as a woman isn't seriously going to go and become a prison officer in a women's prison and demand the right to strip search um, prisoners. But they do. There are men who or, are doing this. Or play women's rugby. Yeah, or... yeah. You know, that seriously, no man is going to go and say that he's going to women want, you know, compete as a woman in swimming. But he is. Yeah. So we're now seeing all those situations arise. And that's the point at which you have to say, you know, you will never be able to play in women's sports. You will never be able to become a female prison officer who can strip search females and you know there's probably sort of you know 15 20 things like that that you will not be able to do no matter what steps you take and then you can think about do you still want to do this operation and, and that's then, up to you and then all of the other things are things that you can do whether you're a man or a woman and that that's the that's the point is that we have reached a stage in society where there are very few things that you can't do because you're a woman you know you used to not be able to get a mortgage or a credit card or vote or you know be a parliamentarian all you know all these things we now know women can do the only things you can't do if you're a man or a woman are things that involve other people's rights and other people's privacy 
there, there just aren't any other things. Wow. And just before we finish, we're going to open it up for a question. So if you have a question, you put your hand up and wait till we get to the mic. But before we go to that, you've been going, what, year, two years? Two years. Two years. Two years. Um, would you have any kind of um, advice about how not to get lost or what weeds not to get lost in? Because it's, it's very easy to lose your way, especially for fledgling organisations. <laughs> now, I called out all the organisations, some phenomenal ones. There's also a huge amount of fledgling that are trying to get off the ground and, and it's difficult. I, I, I have a really um, lot of respect for anyone who kind of sticks to the knitting, whatever that knitting is, whether they're in, you know, organizations need to stick to their knitting and there are individuals who've done amazing things. So um, Helen Staniland, uh, you know, the Staniland question, all she does is ask this one question <laughs> so, so effectively, you know, and there are people who, who have taken it upon themselves just to monitor um, whether, it, you know, when employers do equality monitoring, whether they're asking about sex or gender, or whether they're asking stupid questions about, you know, 56 genders when you're applying for a job. Uh, you know, there are so many things that need to be done. And I don't think it's necessarily do it like us, but kind of identify a thing that needs to be done and have a laser like focus right. on that thing. And if I could add to that, and, and it sounds a bit, you know, wishy-washy but you have to have a theory of change like how do you think things happen and you know there are lots of different ways in which things happen but you will only have a certain skill set uh, so for example you know as Maya said sex matters didn't originally intend to do much in schools but at our second last weekend away we tried to do one each year and we've done two so far at the first one of those we identified schools and um, because it was this microcosm and it was a closed microcosm as well and it was one where nobody has a gender recognition certificate and where safeguarding is meant to come first and where you actually do know the sex of everybody. And um, also because we can't solve the, like we could, we could solve the stock problem of people who believe these things, but no good if the flow continues into the group of people, you know, 700,000 little ideologues every year being pumped out by the school system. But we thought like, how, what's our theory of change? And there are other organizations acting on schools and they're doing good work too. They're thinking about safeguarding or they're thinking about parents' rights or they're thinking about child psychology. But we think about the law and systems. And so we're looking at this and we, we identified, you know, by thinking this through where we thought the pressure points were that we could push on. And that was these incredibly nerdy things about school regulations, the admissions code, also the human rights framework. But the bits where you can go back to government and say, um, you know, some schools, lots of schools are saying that they, children can change the sex that's registered in the role if by just asking. And we go, ah, but the school regulations 2006 say, and by the way, the admissions code doesn't allow you to have any entry criteria that are vague and non-objective and that parents don't know what they mean. And, and then they just don't know what to say back to you because it does say that in black and white and it's statute. So that's our theory of change. Other people have different ones, but you have to know what yours is. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So will we have uh, um, questions from the audience? If you have a question, so keep them short. Keep them short. Just keep questions yeah. short and then we yeah. can try and keep our answers. Yeah, I think we need to have you a mic, Joe. Great. Oh, hi, Mary. I'm from Liverpool and I'm involved with Thoughtful Therapists. And the question I want to ask is around um, why are our government making laws about things they do not need to make laws about? So the hate crime bill and the conversion therapy bill, which is where Thoughtful Therapists started with our MOU. Obviously, that involves our professional organisations and the battles we have with them and our battles to get find out from the government who they've actually spoken to. We have written to them so many times to get freedom of information about this and they will not answer. So It doesn't happen just on this. Um, I call it the politician's fallacy. Something must be done. This is something, therefore, <laughs> this must be done. And they're terribly prone to that sort of thinking, dangerous dogs act and so on. Um, you know, if you're in, if you're in government, you, eat, you think that they're in power, but that's not how it feels to them. You know, they feel there's chaos and lots going on and they can't influence things and there's war in Ukraine and there's inflation and there's energy and blah, blah, blah. It's also difficult. And then someone comes along and said, did you know this terrible thing is happening and we can fix it by writing this law? And there's a model law. They've already got it in, you know, 27 countries with no problems or as they tend to say about gender self-ID, Ireland has introduced it uh -huh. with no problems. 
and that looks attractive to you. Their theory of change is, I can pass a law. It's all you can do if you're a legislature is pass laws. And so that's why they just keep passing laws. It's really difficult. And you have to go and persuade them that, you know, the law isn't necessary. They don't want to say that because when they say that, they're told that they're bigots. Do you not care about poor gay children being tormented, you know? Yeah, so it's it's an endless yeah. problem with governments. They pass laws. And and the conversion therapy one, um, we in the UK, the lobbyists that have been lobbying for the conversion therapy bill really only started when they lost on self-ID. You know, conversion therapy is supposed to be this big problem that's been going on forever and ever. They didn't notice it until they lost on self-ID. <laughs> and it's basically a translation of everything they wanted about self-ID into a new package, into a great piece of marketing, because who wants to say um, they stand up for conversion therapy? It's 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 such a good bit of marketing, um, but it, yeah, it's, it's nonsense. It's really, really hard to say to a politician, this isn't needed, because politicians can say, well, it won't do any harm. Yeah. And then you have to try to explain to them why it will do harm. And it's kind of nebulous, like it's a chilling effect. Um, it, it takes you 15 minutes of serious explanation and no politician has, uh, it has, oh. has 15 minutes to listen to you seriously, trying to explain the difference between sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, so it's, it, you know, it's a real uphill struggle. I think that's going to be the hardest thing to stop is the conversion therapy bills. OK, um, we'll be talking about that tomorrow. We have another question, have we? Hi, I'm very inspired to hear your story, Maya, and the legislation piece. Um, I'm Jenna London. I founded the Natural Women's Council here in Ireland, and we've been doing a group of about 30 women doing loads of uh, on-the-ground work. And what we're seeing is that in Ireland, uh, there's a real social contagion going on, getting some of the material into children's faces in libraries, in schools, in every aspect of society for children. So I think the legal aspect is one thing to change, but... I'm wondering what else we can do. I suppose we've written to all the TDs, we've written to schools, we've had letter campaigns, we were in the GPO and had an inside event yesterday uh, because On Post has, for example, sponsored books that are indoctrinating children into this contagion. So I guess, what else can we do to try to stop it at the child level from a child protection perspective uh, and get this out of schools, which will be starting in the primary school down to age five in the next year? I mean, we see the same materials in UK schools for sure. Uh, I mean, our, our thinking, for what it's worth, is that if you get good guidance, which I don't think you're going to get in Ireland, by the way, but anyway, you know, if, we, if we get good guidance out from the Department for Education that really states clearly that children have a sex, they can't change their sex, and it is not possible to treat children in school as if they are not their sex. You can accommodate them if they're unhappy, of course, but you can't say in a school that a boy is a girl or a girl is a boy because it impacts on other children's rights and safeguarding. We think that if you manage to say that, it then becomes extremely difficult to teach lessons in which you say that you can change sex or to get the sort of outside organization to come in uh, you know, with a, you know, nonsense presentations about gender fluidity or whatever. We, it, it remains to be seen if they, if they can manage to hold those two bits of their minds separately, but it gives parents an extra tool. I do think that parents have, are, are the answer to that one, and it's not easy, and it's grassroots, and there are other organisations doing that in the UK that we work with. And, and getting, getting it into the public domain, getting the publicity, you know, keeping on getting the publicity and the stories out there. We've worked very hard on the press operation for years, us and the other UK groups, and now there's really good connections with a lot of journalists. And there's now a nice fast loop where someone can tell us something, we tell the journalists, maybe even the next day it's in the press, and then we can point politicians that we know are sympathetic to that press story, and 48 hours later there may even be a statement, you know. So, so it, it, this didn't come from nowhere, that was years of work. But that was the same. That was the same in the UK four years ago. It really was. So it's just, it, you just have to keep chipping away. Okay, we have a question over here. Hi, how are you doing? Um, my name is uh, Sandra Adams. I'm uh, the Schools and Safeguarding Lead with the Countess organisation. Um, we're an advocacy group for women and girls, um, particularly concerned about the impact of the GRA. Um, it's not so much a question as, as just a response to, to Yana there. Um, Parents really are the source, I think, of pushback in schools. And um, we have seen that in the Countess. 
parents need to be empowered and to take ownership of their authority over their own children. And that can be done very easily. It is extremely difficult to go into a school and to challenge the authority of a teacher, particularly if you have respect for teaching, as I do, and I think most of us do. Um, but it is simply a question of going in and asking to see what the resources are and then questioning the resources and asking to opt out. And I think that's something that's going to become more and more um, pertinent uh, in the next couple of months as the curriculum is rolled out here. Yeah, we see ourselves as helping individual parents, not on a, on a sort of hand-holding basis, but by doing something that tilts the playing field considerably in the direction of a parent who goes into a school to say, I'm not happy with what they're being told. There's a question way down the end. There's a guy who's very patiently been had his hand up. I think you might have misgendered somebody there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, just in, in reference to uh, setting up organizations in, in other countries, it often seems like uh, the English speaking countries in particular are at the cutting edge of this. Um, but are, are non English speaking countries just kind of looking to the Anglosphere to sort this all out and then follow suit? Or um, does the debate take a, a very different frame in those countries like Brazil, for example? Um, and could there be anything learned from those? I mean, this is a contagion that started in English-speaking countries, specifically one of them, America. So the closer you are culturally to America, the earlier it got to you. Uh, I, know, I know Brazil reasonably well because I lived there for four years as a foreign correspondent before any of this had come up, 2010 to 2014. And, of course, countries... There's now this international human rights system that acts like a sort of marketplace for ideas both good and bad uh specifically on human rights ones things like you know torture convention on torture how you deal with refugees whether you should have a death penalty whether gender identity is the next most important thing in the world and countries like brazil can very unfortunately pick up a sort of made of whole cloth idea and put it into practice without actually having any basis at all like there just isn't a gender identity movement in brazil they're not even teaching this they just they think it's mad but it's been imported and i don't think we've seen this sort of thing happen until relatively recently because these supranational organizations have become so powerful and so rich and there's so many of these uh you know what were national lobby groups that have gone international so I, the question remains to me really and it'll probably be individual country by country to what extent those imported ideas actually implant or to what extent they end up being um you know what brazilians call um para inglês ver for the english to see which means something that you do just for show and that expression comes from when they were still doing slave trading when they had nominally banned it and when the english navy would stop a slave trader and they'd put all the slaves below so that the English could see the ship was not a slave trader. So I think at the moment in places like England, in like Brazil, it's just para inglês ver. Huh. Interesting. I think there's a gentleman there. Thank you. My name is Julian. Um, yes, yeah, speaking on the matter with Brazil and whatnot, I'm from Jamaica and this whole, I, I mean, I've lived in the US for about 20 years and this is the epitome of a first world problem in my view. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The simple fact is that in many countries, including mine, basic health care is yeah. um, it's not readily available to large masses of the population, let alone bespoke things such as, you know, hormone treatments and, and gender affirming surgeries and the like. So that, 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 that's one other matter. But the other thing that I was considering, I was just watching a video this morning about, you know, in, in America, um, basically all the Republican states are now passing laws saying that you cannot give so-called gender affirming care to children, you know, trend, um, I, I, again, hormone surgeries and whatnot. But there's been a lot of opposition, of course, by the liberals saying this and that. And there was even a transgender politician, trans woman in the Montana State Senate Parliament, whatever they, whatever they call it. She, she went as far as to say that it's traumatic not to provide um, hormone um, puberty blockers and allow children, allow minors to go through puberty. I mean, allowing a child to go through their natural bodily development is now a form of trauma and abuse. No, what, 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 what is your take on that? And I hope I don't get canceled from my job for even asking <laughs> such a question. I, I don't know if I'll be the next Maya for status. So I'm just saying. Uh, on, on the first world problems thing, I mean, I. When I started looking at this, 
it was because I was working for an international development organization and that was the first place I looked at this and that you know all of these international organizations are translating these ideas and imposing them on other countries and and they're also doing it inconsistently so you know Amnesty International says uh, you should have single-sex facilities in refugee camps but they also say you should not have single-sex facilities in the UK they don't even join the dots um, and uh, and and although you know it's I, I don't think it is taking hold in countries where people are concerned about much more um, uh, existential matters but wherever people are in contact with international organizations this thing is being pushed at them so uh, we were at a um, feminist conference last year where they did a video link with um, women in a refugee camp in Kenya um, and these women had obviously done video links with other people before and on the bottom of the screen as they were talking to us they all had their pronouns in there and, and that was clearly because they're talking to donors and they're saying what the donors need to hear and these were lesbians these were lesbians who were being discriminated against in Kenya and in, are in a refugee camp but you know the pronoun the donors want to hear pronouns so the pronouns will go in there. I, I heard that um, uh, from somebody who researches in Samoa where they have this third gender fafafine which is men who are very effeminate and who therefore don't count as men but they don't count as women either and fafafine means in the manner of woman and these are now you know the proof that transgender people have always existed and so they're very popular with international NGOs and there's a lot of money if you can find yourself some fafafine but the problem is there are no opposite sex there are no trans men so these organizations are going out and they're finding themselves some trans men because that's what you need to get the money from the Americans. Well, is there one last question? Maybe, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, go ahead. There's be lots of time for more questions afterwards, by the way, because I know there's a lot of people disappointed. We will be having a series of Q&As with different people. Ben Benjamin is suggesting that we ask the, the person here with the red T-shirt, so it'll be good. Okay, yeah, yeah. 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 Hello. Hi, Stella. Hi. Um, it's Ness, thoughtful therapist. I, um, <laughs> hello. Hello. <laughs> um, I, my main question, I'm confused by law. It's not my area of interest particularly. And I'm very interested to hear about clarity in the Equality Act. But surely this all comes down to the legal fiction of the GRA and this terrible law being introduced for, you know, to get same-sex couples to be able to get married. That's not really the case anymore. And as long as it exists, we're going to have 16-year-olds at Topshop who are trying to defend a single-sex space from all kinds of men. So it's self-ID by the back door, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> basically. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, you know, the interesting thing with the petition and this, the, the, the amendment that we're trying to put through is basically to say that a gender recognition certificate, which is only only about 6,000 of them have been given out in the UK since 2004. So there are probably 5,000 in existence given people die. Um, so the very small number of people have these certificates, but because they exist, organizations think they can't ask anyone what their sex is. And when they were trying to push through gender self ID, the whole argument of that lobby was, well, these certificates that you know they're only for marriage, they're only for when you die, um, they don't impinge on anyone else at all. And so we said, okay, if that's the case, well, let's make the law clear. Let's make make it clear that those certificates don't change your sex for the purposes of sex discrimination, and that means they don't change your sex for the purposes of single sex services, which are uh, regulated by sex discrimination suddenly people are saying they're going to leave the country because of this you know these certificates that were only supposed to be about marriage and pensions and now about everything so I think you know the way that we change the law is going to be incremental it's going to be challenging what people say this thing does and making them clarify it and then challenging some more and then challenging uh, wow. The question about privacy, about when when must somebody when when is it a criminal offence to um, disclose that somebody has a gender recognition certificate, for example? But you know there is no political will to do the whole thing all at once. So all we can do is kind of challenge the thing that we can, 
unpick that, unpick the next, unpick the next, which is, you know, which is how we got here in the first place was by the gender lobby using medicine, using schools, using the law and leveraging those three off each other for the past 20 years. It's going to take us time to undo that, um, but we're definitely not stopping with this, this amendment on the Equality Act. Okay, we will be going for a coffee. I think there is one more question, is there? there is a question. Um, yeah, we'll get you now. And I want to remind everybody that everybody who's, who, yeah, everybody who has a question, you will be on, it's live streamed, you will be public, you will be um, on, you know, what do you call it? Not TV, I'm in 1980. <laughs> the wireless. <laughs> You'll be on the wireless. <laughs> so, so, um, <laughs> just just go for it just go for wait, it wait 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 one second and also that um if you don't want to be photographed it's you know it's it's your job not to be photographed do, do you know what i mean that because there's a lot of documentaries being made from canada from america from sweden and it's it's great it's great to have so much media interest and stuff but it is on you effectively to look after yourself on that basis okay work away uh so I just some information from uh, the Irish uh, law and statistical data. Um, I found out the last uh, census that they're actually, even if you have a gender recognition, they're not looking for, they're looking specifically for your biological sex. They're not looking for, even if you have a gender recognition, uh, they're looking for your biological sex. Unfortunately, they don't check this. Uh, there's no way of checking this because, you know, you just put down whatever. But even if you're legally a man or a woman or whatever, uh, it, you're meant to put down your biological sex. And the other thing was, uh, I think, um, I think it's either June or next month, um, Spain is coming in with a gender recognition as well. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a great example of how all these different institutions are trying to decide which definitions they're using when we have competing definitions. And I just think it's going to be years and years of working through and maybe trying to get consistency at the end. And on Spain, yes, you're right. I mean, this is everywhere. These international organizations pop it up everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll go for a cup of coffee, come back in about 15 minutes. And don't forget any hashtag is Time's Up WPATH or Genspec Bigger Picture. Thank you.